Not surprisingly, one's level of anxiety is a fairly stable personality trait, a significant component of their temperament. We vary from our personal hotspot from time to time, but we always return to our resting place. It's as, as this conservation of anxiety is a law of human nature. What makes each of us have their own anxiety level? In part, in part it's because we each experience and respond to the world differently. <coughs> Anxiety is very subjective. Uh, what's really stressful to one person may hardly m matter to another. It's not as simple as a matter as just having the ability to let the small stuff slide. People who are disproportionately anxious see more things as stressful than less anxious people. For the more anxious, fewer experiences fall in the category of small stuff. But simply stating that we're each different only begs the question. What is it that makes us psychologically distinct? The answer, of course, is that we each have a one-in-a-kind brain. Uh, as I explained in Synaptic Self, while all human brains are similar in overall structure and func function, they're wired differently in subtle, microscopic ways that make us individuals. These differences come, out, come about both because of unique combinations of genes we get from our two parents and because of the experiences we've had as we go through life. Nature and nurture are partners in shaping who we are, and that partnership is played out in each of our brains. Scientists and mental health professionals today are greatly influenced in their views of fear and anxiety by both Freud and Kierkegaard, who each regarded fear and anxiety as perfectly normal, yet unpleasant feelings. In fear, as we, we haven't seen, but uh, as you have seen if you read this, in fear, as we have seen, the focus is on a, on a specific external threat, one that is present or imminent, whereas in anxiety, the threat is typically less identifiable and it, its occurrence less predictable. It is more internal in the mind and more of an expectation than a fact. It can also be imagine, an imagined possibility with a low likelihood of ever occurring. A simple analysis of the English language suggests that the words fear and anxiety can describe a range of emotions. These include fear, panic, terror, anxiety, anguish, dread, worry. There are actually more than three dozen English words that are either synonyms for or variants of or aspects of the words fear and anxiety. So, you know, it's often said that Eskimos have, I don't know how many words for snow because that's important in their life. So what does that say about us that we have so many words for fear and anxiety? Someone this afternoon asked about cultural differences. Do other languages have fewer words? I actually don't know the, question, the answer to that question. But the fact is, that the human being is an anxiety machine. And why is that the case? Well, one of our greatest talents is our ability to anticipate the future. Uh, we can do this because we have a brain with the neocortex, that's the wrinkled part that you see when you see pictures of the brain, uh, that has the ability to think, reason, envision the future. Anxiety is the price we pay for an, that ability to imagine the future, because that's what anxiety is, an imagination of a future that hasn't happened yet, but that you are concerned with, worried about, dreading, and so on. So I wrote this book because I had been working on the topic of fear and anxiety for more than 30 years uh, through studies of rats. And when I started this work, I um, entered the field from having studied human subjects um, for some time in my PhD work before that. A lot of that, that human work was done right around here, just over the state line in Vermont and Bennington and up towards Rutland, where there are a number of patients who had, had operations on uh, their brains to control epilepsy in which the brain connections between the two sides were cut in half. So the two hemispheres were now two separate entities uh, that really could no longer communicate. And through that work uh, with my advisor, Michael Gazaniga, um, we had the opportunity to witness what happens when you put a stimulus into the right hemisphere of the brain, which doesn't have the ability to speak, and then ask the left hemisphere, why did you respond in that way? So let's say the, uh, we, through the right hemisphere, we coax the patient to stand up. 
And then we asked the patient, why did you stand up? The patient would answer something like, well, I needed to stretch or you know, I was uncomfortable sitting. Or if the command was to scratch or uh, itch, you know, let's say it was scratch, and the patient would then scratch his hand, you say, why would you do that? He would then say, um, I had an itch. And on and on in, in instances like this, where the conscious language riddled left side of the brain was generating explanations for behaviors that it had no understanding of why they were being produced, because they were being produced by a part of the brain that was separate from uh, in isolation of the language speaking part of the brain. So this for us was a kind of general metaphor for the way the brain works, which is that almost everything the brain does, it does non-consciously. I say non-consciously not to confuse what I'm talking about with the Freudian unconscious. Um, non-conscious means that the brain, mu much of what the brain is doing, it's not wired to enter our conscious minds. Or another way to say it is, Consciousness is probably a relatively recent addition to the brain. Uh, the brain was non-conscious uh, long before it was ever conscious. Um, and consciousness is something that is privy to some aspects of what goes on in the brain, but not others. So in a way, it's a good thing that we can't be conscious of everything happening in our brain, because otherwise we'd never you know, speak a sentence or uh, get anything done, because it would all be invading our minds. Our conscious mind only has access to a limited amount of information, those things we attend to, basically. So when our attention is turned to something, we become aware of it. And attention is kind of the gatekeeper uh, of consciousness. So when we talk about fear and anxiety, really we're talking about conscious experiences. If you don't feel afraid, you're not, in, the sen in that sense, fearful. You have to be fearful and anxious in your mind in order to be fearful and anxious. Now, that, by that definition, which you may not agree with, but by that definition, you can't judge whether someone is fearful or anxious by their behavior. Because their behavior is a very import, imperfect readout of what their conscious mind is doing. Now, I'd been study, <clears throat> studying rats, as I said, for all these years, and looking at their responses to threats. So when a rat is exposed to a threatening stimulus, it will freeze. People freeze too when they encounter a sudden threat. Um, and we called that a fear response because that was the tradition in the field and I adopted the tradition in the field. But having worked on these split brain patients and thinking of the conscious mind as a different kind of system that is observing all these non-conscious activities and also at the time speculating that one of the things that is non-conscious in the brain are all these emotional behaviors that we exhibit. I was uncomfortable for many years with the idea that I was actually studying fear in rats. But I just didn't know how to get out of it. How, you know, how can I study this without calling it fear? So it was a very long time in the making, but eventually I felt I had to say something and come around to a different kind of perspective in order for my work to advance any further and for the field to advance. So one of the key pieces of information though is that <clears throat> there are ways that psychologists can present stimuli to you, to any one of you in this room, uh, that will, let's say it's a picture of a snake or something else that's kind of threatening or dangerous. That stimulus can be presented to you in such a way that will go into your brain, go into the parts of the brain that control things like heart rate and blood pressure and uh, hormone release and so forth, uh, and freezing behavior and all of these things. And it will produce those kinds of responses, but by having presented it in this particular way, which would be a very brief flash, your conscious mind wouldn't know the stimulus is there. And we can put you in a scanner and measure what's going on in your brain. And this part of the brain that I've worked on for all these decades, the amygdala, will light up when you see that picture of a snake. And your heart rate will begin to, uh, to beat faster and your palms will sweat. But because it was presented so quickly, you won't know that it was even there. You'll have no conscious awareness that the stimulus was present and you won't be feeling any fear. So, Fear is not what's causing these so-called fear responses. 
Fear is something else in the brain. What causes these so-called fear responses is the amygdala detecting a threat in the environment and then sending out outputs to the brain areas that then control the responses. I won't say it has nothing to do with fear. In us, whenever we are in the face of a danger and exposed to a threat, uh, our palms sweat, our heart races, and we feel fear. But we're committing the scientific sin of uh, confusing correlation with causation. These things go together in our mind because we, they happen at the same time. But when we study them in the brain, we see that they're separate. The brain system that detects and responds to danger is separate from the system that is consciously experiencing a state of fear or anxiety. And that is why I wrote this book, to get that point across. Because not only is it important in our efforts to understand this as an intellectual exercise, but also people suffer from problems of fear and anxiety. And my work and the work of my colleagues and students uh, has often been used to generate understanding of, of what generates fear and anxiety and to generate treatments, new treatments for fear and anxiety. But in the end, what we're doing is not making much progress. Um, drug companies, for example, are getting out of the anti-anxiety medication business because they are viewing their drugs as having been a failure. But are they really a failure? That's the question. How are these drugs tested and developed? Well, rats or mice are put into a small chamber um, or a large enclosure, then, and um, their behavior is observed. If they're put into a wide open space, what they do is they run to the side next to the wall very quickly. And the reason for that is mice are prey and they need to be protected from predators. They're more likely to be protected if they get close to the wall. They have something, you know, some protection there. Um, so if you give a drug that you suspect might be an anti-anxiety drug to a rat or a mouse in this situation, the rat or mouse will spend more time in the open area. So it's less behaviorally timid. So then when you give the drug to a person, you would expect that person to be less anxious because the timidity and the anxiety, according to the classic view, are both coming out of the amygdala. The amygdala is the brain's fear center, according to the classic view. Um, but what you find is that a person, say, on a serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Prozac, um, is more willing to go to the party, but still anxious when there to some extent. So the drug is a failure because the person is still anxious, but the drug is actually a success if you measure it on the basis of what the rats and mice did. You're getting the person to act exactly the same way the rats and mice did. The rat was more like willing to go to the party in the middle of the uh, arena, and the people are willing to go to the party as well. So the problem is that we've confused the brain systems that detect and respond to danger with the systems that give rise to these conscious experiences of feeling, these feelings of fear and anxiety. And because of that confusion, uh, we are generating research spending billions of dollars over decades and decades studying animals that isn't giving us the result we want. I'm not saying animal research is useless. Obviously, I believe in it because I've done it for so long. Um, and I think it's very important because it is important to get the person to the party. But you have to do more than that. You have to treat the conscious fear separately from the systems that are detecting and responding to threats.